Thanks, Deb. Um, Acknowledgement uh, to the University College of Lilibet, Denmark, and the Association of Radical Midwives to say thank you because without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this. To set up your audio, you go to a meeting on the top bar and work your way through the audio setup wizard. We have a chat window on the right. Please feel free to ask questions and make comments. And if you'd like to start a private chat, you may. To give us your feedback, there's a little man on the top bar with his hands up. You just click on that, and there's a drop-down list. And you can select what is appropriate. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the chat window. This, the chat is used for research purposes, but we do remove the names, and it's just for the information. And if you use the chat facility, consent will be assumed. If you want to speak to ask a question, put your hand up, and we will enable your microphone. To connect your microphone, on the top bar, there is a little picture of a mic. You select it, and it turns green. And allow the flat access to the flash player so we can hear you. If people can't hear you, click on the microphone symbol and adjust the microphone volume. And when you've finished, remember to switch off your microphone. Just click on it again. The recording's already on. Lovely. So if you have just joined us, welcome to the ninth Virtual International Day of the Midwife, 2017. Our next speaker for session five is Catherine Bray. Kate studied as a midwife in the 1980s and moved to New South Wales, Australia in 1986. Kate has been a member of the midwifery group practice and a lactation consultant in hospital and a midwife in hospital and community settings. Currently, Kate is taking a year out of clinical midwifery to focus, focus on her PhD studies. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it looks my microphone is making little... Uh, suggestions that you can hear me, so all good so far. Um, yes, I am taking a year out of clinical practice, and on this ish International Day of the Midwife, it makes me reflect on my clinical practice and how much I'm missing it. And this little baby in the picture was one of um, my caseload um, midwifery practice birth, beautiful water birth, and I was just sitting looking, sitting here looking at the, this beautiful child um, as I was waiting to speak. So hello, and um, I'm going to speak to you today about this uh, mysterious increase in the dose of intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis for maternal group B streptococcal infection, and ask the question, are we doing more harm than good? And I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, um, Professor Marilyn Ferrer and Deb, Deb Davis, Professor Deb Davis, and Drs. Christine Catling, Amy Monk, and John Ferguson, and my lovely research assistants, Kat Flower and Elise Hutt. So, the aims of our discussion this morning is to uh, discuss the dilemma, and I use that word, word advisedly, of maternal group B streptococcus, I'll call it GBS, colonization and management, to consider the evidence around intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis, which I'll call IAP, for the reduction of early onset GBS infection, which I'll call EOGBSI, to look at the reasons why many areas are increasing their IAP, in, uh, uh, IAP dose in line with the American Centers for Disease Control and Infection, the CDC recommendations, and to ask that question, what is at stake? Are we doing more harm than good? This is Michelle O'Donnell, 
He's a French obstetrician and he's written a lot on GBS. And even in 1986, he declared, from the moment we are born, we live in a world of bacteria. We need bacteria. Dr. Odon understands the matter of GBS is complex and we don't always understand why bacteria come and go and, what, and why they're there or, or even if this presents a problem. But bacteria are historically seen as a problem in our community. And 60 years ago, a wonder drug was discovered that saved millions of lives. Penicillin, of course, has changed our lives, but we're now overusing this wonderful asset. There's lots of information about that. And in the case of GBS, we're overusing it, perhaps, by giving a prophylactic dose to millions of well women just in case. There is a risk-benefit analysis, but there's no easy solution or answer to the GBS dilemma. But we need to consider, at least I think we need to consider, are we doing more harm than good? So just a few key terms. A low vaginal, perianal or anal swap reveals GBS maternal colonization, which can be transient, intermittent or persistent. The swab's usually done by the woman herself towards the end of pregnancy. A woman may be thought to be at increased risk of GBS colonization even though she hasn't had the swab taken if she presents with certain risk factors. The baby's colonized with the bacteria either by swallowing infected amniotic fluid or the baby is colonized as she makes her way through the birth passage. I've just realized actually there that infected is not a good term. So she would swallow the amniotic fluid containing the GBS bacteria. She wouldn't necessarily get sick. It's thought that up to 50% of babies whose mothers carry GBS are colonized with GBS bacteria at birth. A baby may be diagnosed with EOGBSI if the bacteria is discovered within 72 hours, although some say seven days after the birth from a normally sterile site. Over 90% of babies with EOGBSI present within 24 hours. So how common is maternal uh, GBS bacteria um, colonization, maternal GBS colonization? Well, it's common. Most studies report a colonization rate of around 20%. And my research, my PhD research on a local cohort of over 30,000 women suggests that GBS levels are similar no matter where you birth or what your level of pregnancy complexity. So, you have a low risk pregnancy and yet you have the same risk of having GBS colonization as every other pregnant woman, regardless of risk. So it makes me ask the question, if this bacteria is pathogenic, why would so many well women carry it? If it's commensal, meaning it's meant to be there, why are we worrying about it? Well, although rates are declining, EOGBSI remains a leading cause of serious illness in newborns in much of the world, including here in Australia. So on the face of it, maybe offering intrapartum prophylaxis to lessen the risk would make good sense. But does it? Although a leading cause of serious illness in neonates, EOGBSI is uncommon. Incidence varies and is difficult to estimate. A recent systematic review held, they estimated the global overall rate at around 0.3 per 1,000 births. That's one in 2,000 of all live births. And ROCOG, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, in their information leaflet explained the figures well. You can see them up here. One in every 2,000 babies in the UK are diagnosed with EOGBSI. 70% of babies recover fully. 20% of babies recover with some level of disability, and 10% of babies will die of infection. Of, of the infection, sorry. So these figures are all babies. Preterm babies are at far greater risk. The mortality risk from EOGBSI is reported at four to 10 times more in preterm than term babies. And depends on which um, research you read as to what that figure is. So you can see that these figures are very rubbery depending on who, you, who you're reading at the time. So overall, one in 17,000 babies die, and 99.85% of babies 
are born to women who carry GBS will be unaffected by death or disability. So let me just say that again, 99% of babies born to women who carry GBS will be unaffected by death or disability. So these figures show that EOGBSI is rare. Improved sanitation and huge advances in neonatal care have reduced the risk of infection disease, infectious disease substantially. But prophylaxis is widespread. So in order for GBS prophylaxis to have a good chance of success, women who are at greatest risk must be identified. Two approaches are recommended, two standard approaches, a universal or culture-based protocol where all women 35 to 37 weeks gestation are offered GBS screening, or a risk-based approach which uses certain pregnancy and or intrapartum risk factors to determine increased risk. And as we'll hopefully illustrate in our poll later in this discussion, different regions of the world advocate different approaches, often based on the same evidence. And it's good to have a, um, a scattering of different countries because I think we will identify that there are different ways of looking at this. So let's put it into context what GBS screening means for women and babies. An Australian study found that over 5,500 women needed to be screened to prevent one case of EOGBSI. So screening, how good are we at, how, sorry, how good are our screening tests? Well, we all tend to overestimate the benefits of screening and underestimate the risks uh, generally. Contrary to what many health professionals think, the average person undergoing screening tests want to and can understand the risks and benefits of a test if they're explained to them in a way that is accessible to that individual. However, we know that shared decision making between clinician and woman uh, is yet to become the norm. And universal screening is a good example of a test that where, where we can overestimate the benefits and underestimate the risks. Given that the consequences of being defined as at risk are substantial, this situation is not optimal. So we know that the screening tests themselves aren't fabulous, so that's not the whole story. The test is only useful if it's performed correctly and then acted upon. So how good do you think health professionals are at following protocols? Well, I've done some work on this, and uh, I can tell you from my work that we're not good at following protocols for screening or following through with the correct prophylaxis. So it's a bit of a mystery that early onset GBSI has reduced so dramatically over the last 30 years. A recent study that I found after my literature review in a cohort of 488 women who were GBS positive, there was a 40% IAP protocol failure. However, almost 80% of these failures were deemed unavoidable. So it would seem that our screening techniques and our prophylactic methods uh, are inherently flawed. Yet despite this, the reported rates of EOGBSI have dramatically reduced, which is quite mysterious. What do we offer to women who are at risk of having a baby with EOGBSI? Well, the mainstay is um, in many high resource income countries, uh, high income countries is prophylaxis um, with uh, penicillin, which is given, which given intravenously four hourly from active labor or induction of labor until birth. So when I looked at why this came about, I was intrigued to find that in the introduction of the 2002 CDC report on this topic, the only study that informed the instigation of IAP for EOGBSI was the 1986 RCT by Boyer et al. This study has been criticised by both the authors of our literature review and by the 2014 Cochrane Review on this topic for a high degree of selective reporting bias and of incomplete outcome data. So I did an integrative literature review, we did, we found 12 studies plus that Cochrane Review and the we concluded that IAP is not supported by conclusive evidence. 
However, the Cochrane says, however, based on existing evidence and expert consensus, IAP is, and that's my bracket, recommended to reduce the risk of early onset GBSI. So we're using um, evidence that is not uh, robust and expert opinion. So why are we increasing the dose? There are two issues. Although I put dosage here in grams and million units, the Americans would be familiar with the million units on the slide, I'll discuss the changes in grams because otherwise it becomes a bit complex. So two issues. One, Many areas, including here in Australia, are increasing their dosage of penicillin from the 1.2 gram to the 3 gram regime. One issue. The second issue, separate to this one, separate to this increase, is the CDC added a change in their 2010 iteration, which gave a recommendation that the 1.5 4 hourly dose could be safely increased to 1.8 if the lower dose was unavailable. That's the second issue. So first, the three gram dose. What's the evidence for this? Now, the three gram dose is a huge increase for those of us that were familiar or are familiar with the 1.2 gram regime. I was really interested to find that the three gram regime has been recommended by the CDC since their first report on GBS in 1996. So where did they, what did they use to base um, uh, this, uh, the evidence to, to base um, this three gram dosage? Well, it was based on a study in 19, uh, a 1989 study by this um, a fellow called Tupperanian. Now, I also, we also retrieved him in our literature review in his study. And like Boyer, this study was deemed, and again, not just by us, but the 2014 Cochrane Review picked it up as well. So this study was, um, it was concluded that there is a high risk of bias. So the, the, the study, um, that the three grams were uh, the evidence, this evidence was used to inform the three gram dose. Now 28 years old, it looked at women described as heavily colonized with GBS. A swab was taken on admission in labor or induction in, or for indu induction of labor on nearly 9,000 consecutive women. And the swab was an agglutination test rather than a culture, so it's different. It was described as rapid, sensitive and specific. 199 women were eligible for this study, and the intervention was the three grams of penicillin. But in this case, uh, this study used three grams every six hours until uh, in labor until birth. So the study concluded that babies of women exposed to IAP had significantly lower incidence of EOGBSI than the controls. And they said IAP would reduce the total incidence of EOGBSI by 25 to 80%. So the CDC introduced IAP at 3 grams stat, but, and I don't know the reason for this, they reduced the 4 hourly dose from a further 3 grams to 1.5. So 3 grams stat followed by 1.5 4 hourly. Because the CDC recommendation um, because of this recommendation, some areas, but not all around the world, changed their own recommendations to reflect the American lead. Australia continued to use the 1.2 gram regime. So there were a variety of dose regimes, but all, no matter what the dose, attributed IAP as reducing the rate of EOGBSI, which is usually stated, that decrease is usually stated as around 80%. So then in 2014, here in Australia, our therapeutic guidelines increased their recommendation from 1.2 to the 3 gram regime. So a lot of us wondered why we had this sudden increase in dosage when EOGBSI rates were so low, not only in Australia, but worldwide. And there was ever more research about the potential associated risks um, of uh, antibiotics. So 
I contacted our local drug information unit and they contacted the therapeutic um, goods guidelines on, on my behalf. And the TGA sent a reply and they said, formulation of the recommendation to increase the dose involved discussion with authors of the Australian Society for Infectious Disease Guidelines, presumably the more experts, in addition to the ROCOG Green Top Guidelines, which are 2012. They went on, there isn't strong evidence to guide the dosing of benzyl penicillin for this indication. Nevertheless, the expert group decided to increase the dose of benzyl penicillin in line with other national and international guidelines. It is not uncommon for local guidelines to differ from national guidelines, particularly when the evidence for a recommendation is not strong. We are aware that some hospitals are using the higher dose, they say, before we changed our recommendation, and others have continued to use the lower dose since we've changed. When they made that declaration, the New Zealand consensus, which is a 2004, 14 publication um, had not been published. It since has been published and uh, gold star to the New Zealanders because on based on their own local research, they, had, uh, they have advised their clinicians to keep the dose at 1.2 and to continue using a risk-based approach, which sounds quite sensible to me. So, then in 2010, and here comes the second point, the CDC suggested the four hourly dose could go up from 1.5 to 1.8 in the three gram re regime. Why? Because there was a, a shortage in the 1.5 dosage in the USA. So in order to reassure clinicians that the 1.8 instead of the 1.5 was safe, they referred us to five references, which some of you may be familiar with. They make interesting reading. The range of 1.5 to 1.8 is recommended, and this is a quote from CDC 2010, so it's recommended to achieve adequate drug levels in the fetal circulation and amniotic fluid while avoiding neurotoxicity. So here are the five references. Um, they were tricky to find, but they are, they are in that 2010 guideline. You just need to know where to look. So they informed the increase in the four hourly dose. These range from 1966 to 2005. And they're about pharmacology and pharmacokinetics of penicillin. So I looked at them and thought, well, what can we learn from them? So I'm going to go through them because there are points of interest in, in them all. So the first one, Bray 1966, which I'm sure is well before most of you were born. They looked at 17 women. It was an observational study and they measured ampicillin in the amniotic fluid. That's the interesting thing here, in the amniotic fluid as well as the fetal and maternal serum. And they suggested active participation with the, by the fetus was suggested as a mechanism in establishing higher levels of ampicillin in the amniotic fluid, probably by uh, fetal excretion, the um, baby passing urine. The more the baby passed urine after the ampicillin, the more concentrated the drug in the amniotic fluid. Fossick in 74, this was a review and a case study, and he says, it would be possible that continuous high concentrations of penicillin could saturate the body's ability to clear this drug with elevations in CSF penicillin levels and resultant neurotoxicity. So I just wondered about this because I have heard that some people, because of the three gram dose, are actually giving it uh, over a period of time. But actually, these people are talking about mega doses, mega units of penicillin over a long period of time, which is not what we're doing with IAP. So Bloom in 96, he had 40 women in his observational study. They found the minimum bactericidal concentrations were achieved in three minutes in all maternal and fetal blood samples. But these levels were not achieved in 15% of women's amniotic fluid. So he wondered, well, 
Could that be because the babies hadn't passed urine? So they concluded that the transfer of the drug from the mother to the fetus was acceptable, but the transfer from the mother to the amniotic fluid was problematic. And then they posed a question, are these, um, are these findings clinically relevant? So he says, if the goal of IAP to the woman is to prevent fetal bacteremia with GBS, then these results would suggest that the bactericidal levels can be achieved almost instantaneously in fetal blood. Yes. However, if the fetus has already become septic before administration of IAP, tissue invasion and injury by GBS may not be quickly reversible. And this may account for the observation that IAP given within four hours of birth has been reported to be ineffective in the prevention of EOGBSI. Interesting. 2005, Chow, he explains the theories of pathogenesis and describes a seminal animal experiment from 1945, where animals appeared listless and uninterested in their surroundings after the administration of penicillin into the cerebral cortex. So I couldn't see how this study was relevant to the question of neuro, neurotoxicity in pregnant women and babies. However, they concluded that since this and other experiments, adverse effects of penicillin on the CS, CNS have become more widely recognized. But it is only recently that we've become to, be, begun to understand the mechanisms that govern neurotoxicity caused by penicillin. And they envisage the potential impact of better designed antimicrobial therapy will result in a lower likelihood of neurotoxicity. He is hoping. The final, 2006, was a prospective observational study. And it went back to consider the optimum timing. They used ampicillin. So it's similar to Bloom's study. He had 21 women scheduled for elective caesarean and they were given ampicillin before the surgery. Cord and maternal blood samples collected at time of birth showed bactericidal levels of ampicillin in the cord blood rapidly was rapidly achieved within 30 minutes and continued to be above the bactericidal levels 5.6 hours after administration. But then really on another note, the authors went on to say, most pharmacological research, including the dosage of penicillin and ampicillin, were not obtained from were, sorry were obtained from non-pregnant individuals, and only indirectly addressed tissue levels I was describing before. So they look at the maternal and fetal serum, but not the amniotic fluid and fetal tissue. So what is at stake with all of this? Uh, scary talk. Well, we've gone through the background of the incident. I didn't, I skipped women's perspective uh, because of time. Uh, and we talked about screening and the prophylaxis and the drug regime. So, so what? So what is at stake? Well, the big so what is the effect of antibiotics on the microbiome and epigenome of the baby. These processes that we know are fundamental to our health. Epigenetics uh, is molecule, they're molecules that lie literally on top of the genes, and they are the interaction of our genes with our environment. They can be switched on and off. And work by various scientific groups, including the EPIC group, are concerned with the effects of the epigenome and the microbiome secondary to interventions in labor, so, and they include the effect of IAP in the list of possible adverse effects on the epigenome and the microbiome leading to adverse health effects. Now I've put this in because I love this story. Uh, this is a picture from the Sydney Morning Herald in 2006 and it says getting time at the zoo. Now the story here is this is the silverback gorilla mama and this is her baby who's seven days old. And it says getting time at the zoo because the zookeepers didn't um, know the uh, sex of the baby after seven days. So 
I use this because I think, well, how does the baby optimize her microbial and epigenetic inheritance? And clearly, this little baby is doing extremely well at that. She had their healthy, healthy mother and baby. They had an undisturbed birth. She clearly had immediate skin to skin contact. Um, and she's had exclusive and early breastfeeding and close contact with her immediate kin and nobody else because. Um, would you try and get this baby off of this beautiful silverback gorilla mama? Probably not. So um, they're doing very nicely uh, at the Taronga Zoo. So what about then antibiotics and the microbiome? What do we know? Well, direct antibiotic exposure changes the, micro, the, the microbiome. We've known that for some time. If we have a course of antibiotics, we get an upset gut. So we're only just beginning to consider the microbial effects of IAP and the possibility of its long-term health consequences. Disturbances caused by antibiotics have been linked to the risk of a negative immune and inflammatory conditions. I did a, a literature review on the effect of the microbiome. Um, there was not much information on the on IAP specifically in the microbiome, but the studies I found were small, but all showed a decrease in the microbial diversity after IAP, in particular the keystone taxa, taxa um, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria both were reduced. So to finish, what can midwives and birth workers do right now? Well, we can update and share our knowledge like we're doing here. We can make a plan together to support and strengthen the antenatal microbiome and epigenetic health um, together with women and add this to the birth plan. We can talk uh, with colleagues, educators, obstetricians, neonatologists. I try to talk to the infectious diseases physicians about the microbiome, that's interesting. Um, but I will still keep talking. We can read our policies and information for women. Uh, and is the, um, the, the story of the microbiome, is the microbiome and epige epigenome health, is that written into our policies? Um, and if it isn't, I believe we need to take action to update this now. Is there another way around the dilemma of GBS? The GBS conversation with women is supposed to enable evidence-informed decisions about the risks women are prepared to embrace. I believe that supporting a healthy antenatal and intrapartum microbiome, so decreasing the incidence of well women um, having a spontaneous uh, release of membranes before labour and the issues that they can run into because of that, uh, and increasing microbial health. That's a whole other uh, story. And also to reduce in intervention. So rather than having a universal approach to, um, un to screening, have a more targeted approach, more like the risk-based approach, uh, where we watch and wait for signs of, of infection and then treat in labor. So we know that maternal colonization with GBS is common and EOGBSI is rare. We know that many thousands of women and babies are exposed to high doses of antibiotics in labor. We know that there is no robust evidence to support the effectiveness of IAP or its alternative, and I'm talking about chlorhexidine there, or the dose of IAP that's currently recommended by many jurisdictions. We know that a healthy microbiome is fundamental to human health, but we don't know yet the full effect of IAP on the microbiome. However, I believe as midwives and maternity workers, we have a duty of care to understand the current state of knowledge, which is why I'm doing this PhD, and pass this on to people who need it most, the women in our care. So thank you. Um, we do have some poll questions. I wanted to wish everyone a happy International Midwives Day. Um, and I will hand over, I think, to Sarah because she will put up some poll questions for us. Thank you, Sarah.
Thank you so much for that. Okay, let's see. Oh, hold on a sec, sorry. Here we go. Oops, made that huge. Can you so see can that there, but it's not. Um, it's not reopening. I can see it, okay. Um, I'm trying to clear I'm not sure why it. It won't let me clear. Um, oh, wait, here we go. Shall Just we? There we go. Reopen. Okay. There you go, Kate. Can you see okay. that? Well done. Yes, do you have a guideline for management of the Do you have here? a guideline? Everyone that's listening to. Yeah, everyone. Well, everyone who said who's come into the poll has a guideline and it's going up. So, yes. Which is interesting because what else I should say to you is is it in date? Because a lot of people are holding back with their update of the guideline because this is a very contentious area. Okay. Okay, I'll end this poll. Yeah. And we'll open the second one. So, you feel uncomfortable about, yeah, so immediately you answer, yes, I feel uncomfortable. But not all of you do. Most of you do feel uncomfortable um, about the management of GPS. In your area. Brilliant. We broadcast those results. Okay. Yep. We'll close those polls. Just going to mute your mic, Deb. It's quite noisy your end. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Jean Patterson. In <laughs> that's right, Deb. Jean Patterson in New Zealand. Um, thank you, Kate. There is also the issue of anaphylaxis and antibiotic resistance. Yes, thank you, Jean. There certainly is, and I I've just been to the Sarah Wickham workshop in New Zealand and I spoke to lovely, a lot of lovely um, New Zealand midwives and a midwife had told me about a recent anaphylactic episode um, in her area uh, and, and how that episode affected the way that they uh, used IAP because it's, I think it's, it's sort of something like one to four in 100,000 women um, but of course when it happens it's dire. Um, and yes, thank you for bringing it up because it certainly is an issue. Antibiotic resistance, of course, is a big issue. 
But when I've spoken to infectious diseases physicians, um, they've said yes, but yes, but not in penicillin, and and uh, that seems to be the case. True, and that's of course why we use penicillin because of its narrow spectrum. Um, but I, it's still up there as an issue for sure. And there's a question from Mercedes um, asking, what is the percentage of false positives in screening? Uh, the figures are very rubbery, Mercedes, depending on what um, uh, research you read and what reports you read. But it's certainly an issue. There are always, because of the transient nature of uh, GBS um, and because we uh, swab women not at the time of labour, but maybe up to six weeks, um, hopefully within six weeks before, uh, then there are going to be women who are GBS negative at, at screening and GBS positive at birth and the right and the other way around. Um, so the, the figures um, often are not huge, but uh, they are in my opinion, they are significant and they're always um, mentioned. And, and I will say um, from some research I'm doing on early onset sepsis, uh, the amount of women who were GBS negative and then the baby um, has the disease was significant. Thank you for that, Mercedes. And Kat has just asked, how can we reduce colonization of GBS in practice? I've read that VEs increase transfer and stretch and sweeps should also be avoided. Yeah, in all the um, research I've read uh, on this particular area, everyone has said it doesn't make any difference. Uh, however, just for a minute, a personal point of view, um, I think well, we know that GBS grows in the lower third of the vagina and by um, putting anything therefore into the vagina, obviously into the lower third of the vagina then up and through the cervix uh, has the potential to cause uh, some uh, transfer of bacteria sort of higher up the vagina. So, um, but the ev there is no evidence to, sh to say either way whether that's, that's an issue. I think rather we need to be thinking overall, is it useful to do this VE and does, is it useful and does this woman, uh, would she really benefit from the so-called stretch and sweep? Thank you for that, Kat. And Megan is typing. So we just have time for a couple more questions. Oh, we're just waiting. Oh, she stopped. I figured I might just talk instead if that was okay, because I was trying to spell prophylaxis and I couldn't really get there. So I thought, well, maybe I should just talk it. Um, I'm curious about uh, the group B strip when it comes to um, elective, especially caesarean sections, because then you know the membranes haven't ruptured, and the fact that they've found group B strip um, in babies who have who have been born by elective caesarean section or caesarean section without rupture of membranes, but there doesn't seem to be a protocol for uh, any of this prophylaxis around group B strip when um, the the caesarean section is planned. No, it's Megan Cone, sorry. Yep. Hi.
No, I missed the middle bit, but I think I understand the gist of what you're saying there. Um, is this Mercedes I'm talking to? Or Jean, maybe it's Jean in Dunedin. Uh, anyway, sorry, Megan. Hi, Megan. Um, Thank this you is for one that. area where everyone seems to agree. And um, lovely to hear someone talking, Megan. Last one um, is from Mercedes again. Um, in the case of a woman who is in her second pregnancy, so the previous so one with so positive screening, and um, in this one it is negative in, uh, by a reliable source, is uh, course, indicated the same as the antibiotic by neonatiology. For a different reason, of course. That's for the mother, and that's for uh, maternal um, risk of infection. Uh, but the the evidence is very, or the the guidelines are very clear. I don't know about the evidence. The guidelines are very clear that it it's not required, and the rationale is because the incidence is so so very low. I'm not sure what that last bit means, but I, what you're saying is that um, the first pregnancy, uh, the woman was positive but didn't have a baby affected. And the second one, um, she was screened and she is negative. Now, if that's the correct situation, yes. then nothing should be done. I think you answered her question there, Kate. Treated, <laughs> Thank um, you, Mercedes. Lovely. Um, Thank you so much, Kate. I think we all learned a lot. It's always a an interesting pro um, topic. Uh, is, that, is that what you mean? Is that the situation you, that you so we'll just it's a, it's a common issue, this one. Um,